Hey everyone, welcome. We'll continue our reading of Hamza Yusuf's commentary on Imam Mawalud's poetry. We're in a new section. This is with the poem verses 67 through 72, and it's titled Blameworthy Modesty. So let's see where he heads with it. As for blameworthy modesty, it is that which prevents one from denouncing the commendable or from asking a question concerning a matter relating to religion and the like. For this reason, it is considered a harmful quality. As for noble modesty, it is such as the chosen one's behavior the night he married Zainab. Okay, with Zainab, noble modesty, blameworthy modesty. When he fed his company to their full from his wedding feast, and they all left except for the three. They lingered, yet he did not request that they leave. Such modesty is an excellent virtue. Okay, so not saying, hey, you have to go out now. It's like more polite, kind of like, hope they get the social cues to exit. Had modesty been a person, it would have been a righteous one and would do nothing but good in whatever it did. I would like to see that tested, though. How do you be modest when you're faced with assault? In general, modesty is something praised in Islam and is considered virtuous. Modesty becomes blameworthy if it prevents one from denouncing what clearly should be denounced, such as tyranny or corruption. The form of modesty results in meekness at a time when one needs to be forthright and courageous. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. That's exactly where I was going for it. Because I was about to say, like, the one of the problems is when a religious group allows tyranny to exist and they think that's the form of meekness and submission of being, you know, really uber soft and then they get trampled on. Whereas others would say, hold on though, but you also have to worry about those fundamentalists who seek to be too dogmatic and they have no tolerance for anyone else who thinks differently than them so is a, these are like the flip side you don't you want to have a balance pretty much is what i'm getting from this something commendable munkar is condemnable regardless of the status of the person who is engaged in it whether he or she is a close relative or a person of status wealth or authority so something condemnable so munkar so your status isn't going to save you, which makes sense. There must be agreement, however, among scholars on what is condemnable. One cannot, for example, declare decisively that something is considered condemnable if there is a difference of opinion on it among the scholars. Scholars knowledgeable of the plentitude of juris ju juristic differences rarely condemn others. They refrain from such condemnation not because of modesty but because of their extensive knowledge and scholarly insight. Unfortunately, many people today are swift to condemn, which creates another disease, self-righteousness. Self-righteousness versus blameworthy modesty and noble modesty. Okay. Juristic differences. So scholars should not condemn one another unless it's a grave offense, I guess. That's what I'm getting from this. Blameworthy modesty results in timid failure to denounce what unequivocally deserves denouncement or to ask about important matters from those who are knowledgeable. Okay, so if something deserves denouncement and there's no argument if, sans, or but about it, you better speak up, essentially, is what I'm getting from this. Because then you're being a failure. <clears throat> if you're being too timid, it's going to cause a problem. The prophet's wife... Aisha once said, The best women were the women of the Ansar, because modesty did not prevent them from learning their religion. A woman once came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, asking a specific question about menstruation. The Prophet, peace be upon him, answered her, but the woman persisted in asking for more detail. The Prophet, peace be upon him, then asked Aisha to show the woman what he meant, for it was awkward for him. Some women even sent the cloth used for their menstrual protection to seek out with certainty what constitutes the beginning and end of the menses. That's a little that's a little unsanitary. You can get a disease from that. Why would you touch that? 
It's unclean. Which determines whether or not certain rites of worship may be resumed. I mean, you should wait until you're until the whole cycle is done to where there's nothing coming out at all to where you can feel the tightness inside your your cervix again or your pelvis area no that's a little unsanitary but i get they wanted that level of distinction most women would not feel comfortable with that but the modesty of these women did not prevent them from seeking out knowledge about their religious affairs so they had a an eagerness to learn so it was an embarrassing question but they had to ask it either way imam speaks next of virtuous modesty which is rooted in generosity and kindness this is an acceptable kind of modesty he gives the examples of the behavior of the prophet peace be upon him when he married zainab the prophet peace be upon him invited people for a wedding ceremony and meal the guests came but lingered in his presence much longer than necessary. In fact, three of them remained late into the evening. The Prophet, peace be upon him, and his generosity stayed with them and patiently waited for his guests to complete their visit. I think like that's like, that happens a lot at weddings, to be honest. But that's why you have a reception planner. The guests, however, tarried with the Prophet, peace be upon him, because they loved his company. At one point, the Prophet, peace be upon him, stood up, left the room, and then came back hinting as gently as possible that they should depart. But they still like <laughs> I wonder like you know like who they were, who were they? He did this again and then a verse was revealed with regard to the etiquette of being in another's home. An admonition that the Prophet peace be upon him himself was too shy and generous to deliver. Okay. Quote Believers, when you are invited then enter. And when you have completed the meal, disperse and do not linger on for conversation. This used to hurt the prophet, but he shied away by it from telling you. But God is not shy of the truth. Quran thirty three fifty three. Yeah, I always thought about what that verse was. It's kind of like very specific. It's, it's interesting, though, that that is in a holy book. Right? If you really think about it. Your table mannerisms of how you be a good guest, right? This verse applies in particular to visiting people whose obligations and time constraints are greater than others, such as statesmen and scholars. They may also feel shy about cutting visits short when they are the hosts. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was too modest to tell his guests that it was time to leave. It was out of his generosity and benevolence that he did not address his guests this way. I mean, yeah, right? You gotta be kind. But I think I, I'm just so kind of much of a hermit. I hope I don't have to ever go to get through that. Uh, I leave when I want to leave. And that's why I don't, I don't have visitors. You visit me, I won't answer the door. I would only accept very few people visiting me. I'm just not that kind of person. Of course, some people would feel no consternation at all at this asking their guests to leave. And they would do so in an unambiguous terms. Imagine then how pure and wonderful was the Prophet, peace be upon him, the final messenger sent to humanity, a man bestowed with great authority from God himself, yet he was still too shy to request his loitering guest to leave on his wedding night. The Imam concludes this section saying that had modesty been a man, he would have been a righteous man whose actions would always be virtuous. Okay, so modesty being linked to virtue. I mean, yeah, we have a lot of that in society. Uh, a lot of people hold that view, right? Modesty is a signal of your virtuousness. And then unmodesty is a, an example of your basement. Your debasement, your overall base level. Carnal level. Now, again, we have to think about what kind of guests do we be. I'm pretty good at picking up social cues of when you gotta go, right? If someone's having a conversation and you're talking to them, you gotta go. But, uh, yeah. Thanksgiving is also kind of like that holiday gatherings. Funerals, not so much, right? You kind of have to get your cues too at a funeral as well. Not just dinner. Really any event. So we really have to think about when is it time to go, right? Don't, don't hang out too long. 